following interview was conducted with Grant Kepner, Director Emeritus of Safety and Security uh, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on uh, August 25th, Wednesday, 2010, at his residence in West Lafayette. Also sitting in is his wife, Janet. Thank you, that, Mr. Kepner, and I welcome you, and I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to contribute. Thanks. Uh, let's start. Tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. It's been a while ago. Uh, I was born uh, in October of 1937 in Lincoln, Nebraska. Okay. Um, my father was a printer. And my mother was uh, worked for the credit bureau in Des Moines. We finally moved to Des Moines. Uh huh. And uh, I basically grew up in Des Moines. Most of your time was spent there. Then, oh yeah. Your life, uh huh. Yeah. Then. Uh, what was grade school like? Did you go to grade school there? Yeah, yeah. It's a good deal different than they are now. Sure. Uh, for one thing, we didn't have school buses. We walk. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, I kind of got along okay in grade school. Uh, it was high school also in Des Moines? Tell us a little about high school. Well, actually, I went to high school in West Des Moines, which is a separate uh -huh. city. Uh, I was planning on college, so I, I focused on uh, collegiate uh, preparation. Uh, was in a band. I enjoyed that. What instrument did you play? I played the bass horn. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that was... That was heavy. I remember that well. <laughs> anyway, uh, did, you, uh, did you also participate, or did you um, for the or at athletic so events and stuff? Did you play? Oh no, uh, they didn't, huh? we didn't have a whole lot of athletics. It's a very small school. Sure, uh, we had I think three hundred and fifty in the whole school. Oh okay. And uh, uh, they had some some sports, so some. Athletes. Yeah, they did. They did. Uh, yeah, football primarily. I was. Very light then, I can already remember that, but yeah. uh, very small for football. Then tell us a little about college professors and where you went to college and how oh, you decided yeah. to go. You went to Illinois Institute of Technology, huh? Yeah, yeah, I was very uh, fortunate. I got a scholarship there, a uh, full ride scholarship from the Western Actuarial Bureau out of Chicago to, uh, to become a fire protection engineer at Illinois Institute of Technology. And uh, that took four years. It was it was difficult. Uh, mainly, it was focused on chemistry, a lot of chemistry. Four years of chemistry, as a matter of fact. Wow. But uh, all those test tubes and stuff, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, that's pretty much the way it went. I worked in Chicago some. I, uh, I was. Did uh, you live right on campus? Because that's sort of in the oh, in oh yeah central yeah, central it, Chicago. Yeah. It, uh, it basically, it was a ghetto then, and probably still is. But anyway, it's, uh, it's all, the, all the students that didn't live at home lived on campus. Sure. I uh, joined a fraternity there, Phi Cap Sigma, and stayed there. And uh, oh, they had they had a house on there. Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, nice. oh yeah, yeah. That made it nicer. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of the uh, non-Chicago area students long to fraternities and there's a lot of fraternities there and that's where we lived. <laughs> yeah. What was the uh, the enrollment? Was it more outside Chicago area? Would you the bulk of it or uh, no, no not really. Uh, I think the majority of their students come from the Chicago area. But uh, anybody from outside were on scholarships. Either uh, WAB or uh, one of the military Nazi scholarships it was very popular in those days. And it, it was a good deal for those guys but Virtually everyone that uh, didn't live in Chicago came on a scholarship. Right. Were you in the ROTC? No. Oh, okay. No, no. Okay. no I had a, uh, as a part of the scholarship, I had a three-year commitment to work at a firm in Iowa. And, uh, after graduation. After graduation, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, uh, fire protection, is that what you said? You yeah, had? yeah, yeah. It, that, uh, Oh, there's only two or three schools in the country that offer that particular degree. Oklahoma and Maryland do, uh, IIT. But uh, it deals with uh, the engineering side of fire protection. Okay. And Which is key, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I worked for the uh, Iowa Inspection Bureau after graduation for three and a half years as I was committed. And... Uh, with them, I was working mainly in uh, sprinkler protection. Uh, 
and some non-sprinkler risk analysis. But main, mainly it was risk analysis and uh, it's for principally the stock fire insurance companies. But all in all, it, it was kind of boring. <laughs> and uh, another IIT graduate by the name of Clay DeMint was then the uh, superintendent of safety and security here at Purdue. And he went back to, he wanted to hire someone to take over the, the fire protection and safety engineering part of his job. So he went back to IIT, uh, their uh, alumni placement office, and my name was there. And uh, he wrote me, and I was interested because uh, a classmate of mine took a similar job down at IU Bloomington. And he seemed to be happy down there. Same thing, same job, basically. So, so I come to work at uh, Purdue in uh, July of '63. Uh, okay. Were you married at the time? Yes. Yes. Okay. Where did you meet your wife? High school. <laughs> high school. We were seniors in high school, and uh, good. We got married uh, for my last year in college. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. She moved to Chicago with me there. We lived in a dorm. They had uh, for married student housing. They had big sure. dorms there. And she worked at the, uh, in claims uh, control. She worked at, she was a claims adjuster for uh, Bankers Insurance, was it, Janet? Bankers, why? Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. not, not to be confused with Bankers Life Insurance. Anyway, she worked there and then she transferred to the same kind of job there in uh, Chicago. She worked for finding gear. Sure. I worked uh, Merchandise Mart. I was a janitor <laughs> over Christmas and New Year's vacations. It, there's really uh, furniture moving. They, they're getting ready for the big furniture show right. in January, so they hired a bunch of us college students uh, to move furniture for them. That's what we did. And I, I did uh, contract work up there for a large company that was moving a waterfall paint spray booth and ovens from their one suburb to another suburb. So uh, me and a roommate of mine uh, contracted to dismantle that. It was a big electrical thing. So yeah. Uh -huh. Took months. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. That's that's my working career up until okay. time that uh, I came to Purdue. Well, tell us about your initial. No, initially you were just the superintendent of safety, well, safety engineer, huh? Yeah. Originally, the, the title was safety engineer, uh, which was my predecessor's title. Was that, did Mr. Co DeMint have Mr. that Mr. DeMint, yes, okay. yes, he did. And uh, I come here in, in July, and my job was going to be uh, in the fire protection and safety area both. And I think I inspected one building. Was that a new position or? No, it was, it was uh, been around. Uh, he had the position of safety engineer was his title. Uh -huh. And then he became superintendent of safety and security. And he was still a safety engineer, and it was, it was a lot. It was a lot of work, so he hired me. But my first job was to uh, coordinate the construction of the Grant Street parking garage. That was part of my job, evidently. Yeah. And and uh, what was there before the garage? A house? There were several houses. Oh. They they tore them down. There's old houses across the in there, and uh, so I had my I had to kind of work with the contractor and the construction department, make sure. What we needed was done, and then I had to staff it. And in those days, we, we had a, an attendant on 24 hours a day, so I had to hire some guys to do it and set up the accounting and all that stuff that goes with it. And, uh, that took a lot of time. Let me yeah. ask you this. How did they recognize, because now we have our cards, we swipe the card. I mean, was this for, for was it originally for visitors and staff, the Grand Street Garage? Yes. Okay, like yeah. it is today. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, we had permits in. Oh. I was I was on the parking committee right from the day one. Uh, there were several very, very nice people on that committee. I remember mm -hmm. a lot of them, Jack Smalley and KB Woods and uh, Clay DeMint. And there were several. John Gantz was on it. And, uh, but anyway, they designed the system. And I got there in, in, on, on the ground, <laughs> just starting up. And so it was kind of interesting. There was, there was a lot of challenge. And, uh, sure. I was no longer bored, which is why I left. Was <laughs> the original one about as high as it is now? About the same height? About the same height. Okay. About okay. the same height, yeah. 
Now, the original one had 525 parking spaces in it, so it's pretty much... The one, the new one, I think, has more space. But uh, the first one was all poured concrete. Wow. But that was, that was kind of fun. Now, I did some uh, inspection work, special hazards. Uh, they, they, right, shortly after, they put in the rocket lab. Oh, and, okay. Uh, Is that Zucker? Hmm? Zucker Labs? Or not, just a rocket lab? or Oh, no, the rocket lab down on, oh. uh, on uh, by the airport. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Next anyway, uh, Chuck Erickson was head of it in those days. But they got a government contract to test hydrazine, which is a very explosive rocket fuel liquid. And uh, they asked me to design a, a sprinkler deluge system for protection out there. And I've been involved in that kind of thing before, so uh, that was one of my first jobs is to uh, design a sprinkler system that was effective for hydrazine. And uh, oh, similar things like that throughout the sure. years. Yeah, just uh, a lot of it. Okay. Then you became the superintendent, and you're the first director um, yeah. of safety and security. Right? Yeah. Well, two years after I started, Clay DeMent. Uh, moved up to uh, director of uh, buildings and grounds, I think his title then, and vacated the superintendent of safety and security, which I became. And then uh, years later, they changed it to director of safety and security, and uh, the next job was folded in with uh, another person's job, and it was the vice president of physical facilities, as it is now. Okay. Well, that was a progression of the of the chair, so to speak. Okay, tell us a little about what the safety and security, and then I was going to. You also had some departments. We'll talk a little about the police and the fire. Okay. Yeah, you know, uh, but safety and security, just for the researchers, uh, encompassed these other departments. Was that your primary responsibility? Yeah. Did you say? Yeah, okay. Yeah. When I first came to Purdue in '63, uh, they had uh, oh, I think it must have been about 18 man police department. They had about four or five watchmen. And they had a, uh, a crew of about four or five people that uh, serviced fire extinguishers and fire hoses and safety showers and uh, fire and safety equipment stuff. Okay. In the, within the buildings on campus? And yeah, campus on, okay. yeah, yeah. And uh, Clay uh got approval from the trustees that July, I think it was July, maybe June, to start a fire, fire department. And uh, he interviewed and got a chief, Walt Hart, out of uh, University of Illinois. And I became involved in setting up the fire department. Uh, and it was originally in the Naval Armory, which is where the Farmers Building now sits, uh, just north and west of the, of the armory that is there. Okay. And it's 24 hour shift, so we modified uh, part of the building so they have a, a bedroom in the kitchen area. Sure. Workout area. So that winter, uh, in December, we started up uh, at our own fire calls. So we had enough guys, we had them trained and uh, went into business. Did you have room for the trucks, the fire trucks? We only had one truck. We had oh. one truck. Uh, it was a 100 foot aerial ladder truck and it was, it was a nice rig. And that's the only thing we had to start with, so we didn't have to worry about other trucks. <laughs> Who handled the training? Would you get some? Did you bring somebody? Walt Hart in? did most of that. He okay. was uh, the uh, first chief. That yeah, and he okay. he had experience with the University of Illinois Fire Department. Okay. And uh, so he did most of the training. And then we there's a lot of manuals and, and training things available. Sure. And, uh, that you could tap into and utilize. Oh, yeah. yeah, we did yeah. that. We did Any that. special things happened when the thing first got up and running? Well, the first fire was phenomenal. Uh, it happened right there at the at the uh, naval armory. They they had something in the oven. They caught fire. The firemen did. So they they created their own business, so to speak. <laughs> Close to home, sir. Yeah, right? it was. Did you it say was. that? <laughs> yeah, that, that was the first run. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now talk a little bit about the um, police department. Yeah. yeah, when I when I come here, it was uh, well in in '63. Uh, police departments are a good deal different than they are now. The guys, yeah, well, tell us what it was like. Yeah, well, 
especially campus wide. I mean, I'm oh, yeah, on campus. You, you hired someone. Gave me a uniform and gun and said, "Go out and take care of things." <laughs> that pretty much the w- w- way it worked uh, initially, you know. And they, I, we're talking just like when people say, "When I went to school in the '40s, I only had to pay X amount of dollars." And they sort of shrug their shoulders, and I say, P- "Researchers put it in the proper perspective. You know, they understand that." Yeah. And that's why I'm asking what uh, it was like in those days. I, it was this, nice. and uh, where did you did you where did they? operate out of what building or anything? Oh, well, uh, the Engineering Administration oh, Annex. Enet. Yeah, Enet. What's okay. called a Z-Net? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, uh... They were there for a long, long time. Oh, yeah. When they, I came in the, yeah, school, in the late 60s, I mean the 70s, until they yeah. built, moved out to where they are now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was... It was in the center of campus, which was handy. Sure. Right. But, boy, were we packed. Uh, the legal authority for the officers came... We was all deputy sheriffs of the of our local sheriff. So we had that kind of legal authority. And we uh, worked long and hard to, to get the uh, state to pass a state law enabling uh, police powers for university officers. Which we finally did, got it done. Oh, it did not exist? It did not exist in those days. Uh, one of our officers, officers Carl Schaefen, who was the head of the FOP, and I, I don't know how many trips we made to Indy and talked to legislators. He made more than I did. He really put a lot of effort in it. But finally, we got a bill passed. And the university was backing us. Don't get me wrong. We weren't doing oh, this yeah. on our own. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, they, they were uh, strong for it. And uh, we got her done. And uh, we grew quite a bit. And in those days, uh, vandalism, you know, that kind of thing, uh, they had uh, panty raids at night in the, in the late fifties, and then it went all the way up until who knows when. <laughs> but it was it was right when I came. But no one no one got too excited about it. No one got hurt or anything. They were just the kids having fun. Uh, theft was a big issue. So, you know, people steal stuff. And it was. It was I think a quieter time than what it is now. Right. Okay. Vietnam War, though. Well, then thing, things uh, in the sixties, they they kind of. Yeah, 60s. that was one thing I know that you addressed even in your retirement. The student, well, student unrest. And yeah, yeah. That's was, what some like interviewees refer to it as, <laughs> in quotes or whatever, you know. Oh, well, in, in the late sixties, uh, it was it was nationwide. Uh, it started out west. Hey, Ashbury, and uh, and this group it went east. It just, and, and Purdue was affected just like everywhere else. We started having uh, old student riots, I guess you'd call them. <laughs> they weren't they weren't violent, especially in, in early in early days of the of the situation. And but they get out and run around and carry on and have signs. Uh, it's lighting fires. Matter of fact, I went out to uh, California on a, on a business trip, and uh, some of the firemen out there were carrying guns, which seems, you know, what seemed terrible then, it seems terrible now. Right. That's not their job. But anyway, uh, it became a little more violent, uh, and I, I guess that the pinnacle was uh, in '68. Uh, what was it, March? when they had the Kent State shootings. That really tore every campus up. And we weren't immune to it. We'd, we'd had stuff. We had uh, SDS and the Weathermen and uh, A.B. Hoffman came down in business and a bunch of celebrities, I guess you might say. But uh, it wasn't causing any great problems. Uh, I remember a lot of the individuals at that time that were very uh, prominent. Uh, Bill Schmoot was the uh, campus editor for the editorial for the exponent. Uh, Stan Jones was a student body president. And uh, I remember one, the same Stan Jones that uh, went on to mm-hmm. politics, but I remember one night uh, they were, we, we had, uh, the kids were throwing rocks through the armory windows. And we, I had some officers inside the Army, 
it was about eight or ten of us. <laughs> and I went out in the crowd, and, and there was Stan Jones, and he was wringing his hands, and you know he was unhappy with the way that he was. Because he was a student, he was a student body president at that time, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that kind of that kind of uh, ended fairly peacefully that night. The kids finally went home. Well, we, we saw a half dozen broken little windows, and that was it. Wasn't any big deal, but uh, about that time we expanded the police department. Uh, I remember I, I got a call from uh, the vice president's office, uh, Lionel Freehaver, called up. He's my boss and me. We went over. He says, "I want you to increase your police force." So he gave us, I think it's like fourteen more positions, and. Uh, we needed them, and that brought us up to about 50 police officers. And things were really getting tense. And uh, it was in 68 that I met, I, I went through some of my old yeah. calendars to see if I can get the date right. Cause it gets a little blurry. <laughs> but uh, they had that, uh, oh, Kent State was in 70, wasn't it? I believe so, yeah. March of 70, yeah. Right, but in '69 we had the, the uh, it's crazy. It was a PMU food riot or some damn thing. Uh, it was uh, there's a food boycott. They had a big rally on the mall. Had maybe a few thousand kids out there, and uh, we got along fine. We could walk through the crowd individually in uniform. And, you know, they talked. So it never was a problem. Never, never felt. Uh, you know, intimidated by them at all, or vice versa. They didn't feel intimidated by us either. But then, uh, in April of '69, they they were still upset about this food business. I don't know what the issue was, but uh, they went up to Hubby Hall, and, and uh, about twenty five of them went into Don Mallet's office. He's the vice president for student services, and and they finally left. Talked to them, they left. And then a few days later, uh, they went back up there, and uh, we arrested forty-one. They wouldn't leave then. At five o'clock, we sent everybody out. And they went, they so we wound up arresting about forty-one of them, and we spun on a bus, took them down the right block, let them go. But we got their names and everything, uh, and no, no charges were filed. And it was okay. You know, sure. we got the building empty, and uh, that that was, uh, it was that wasn't food. Then that was a fee increase. All the students got very excited about that. Uh, they increased the, the tuition fees. Tuition, tuition fees. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was in '69, and that, that didn't go away real quick. Uh, that was in early April, late April. They they went down to uh, the Union, and they occupied that. They just maybe a thousand kids I suppose and they was there forever it seemed like I know I I, uh, <laughs> I even had a room down there with the, did you have enough people in, in the police department to handle yeah, this yeah. Oh. yeah well you gotta keep in mind that uh, these weren't violent kids they weren't we did uh, we did have a few just a handful that were that were violent we knew who they were we had a lot of intelligence running in uh Throughout the student body, and we knew who the bad ones were. And then there's just, yeah. I bet, I bet there wasn't more than half a dozen that were really uh, threatened, damaged, but they was, they was enough. And we set up uh, additional night patrols using our service staff carpenters, electricians, and plumbers. And sure. They come in, uh, oh, like eight in the evening, we'd give them a radio, and we'd have lookouts on top of buildings, and they'd walk the campus. And there was a firebomb that they threw and down on the south campus, went through a, an office swim window of a professor's office. But uh, one of our guys saw it right away and we got the fire truck there and minimal damage. Broken window, maybe some scarred papers and stuff, but uh, that was the only really physically violent act right. that they, they uh, did. But anyway, they occupied the Union. Oh, it must have been a week or so. And, uh, I remember the university was getting very concerned about it because it was getting uh, 
an opposing element. Uh, one of our very, very prominent, very excellent football player was kind of leading the opposition. <laughs> and he could have cleaned it out by himself, <laughs> but fortunately, he liked the place and was able to talk to him. But anyway, he was seeing a growth in this anti, anti-hippie kind of thing. And then uh, at the same time, he's picking up uh, information out of, the, out of the crowd over at the Union and actually a document that was telling people to bring weapons. Uh, this is you know, this is getting out of hand. And the reason he's telling people to bring weapons is because the, the opposition was going to come in and clean plows, I guess. But uh, So it was decided at the highest level that uh, we had to end it. And uh, I remember I got called in and uh, I discussed with the president and the board of trustees what libel will happen and how we can do it and so on. And they said, well, it's got to be done. So it was about midnight. There was about 21 officers, including myself, went over there. To the Union? To the Union. We went into the back. We didn't want anybody to see us coming. Uh, and Barry went out in twos. It was in the uh, ballrooms. We went out in the corridor, just two of us at a time. I didn't do this. I was supervising. <laughs> Two officers go out in uniform, and uh, we made an announcement. You know, we're going to arrest those people that don't leave. So everybody leave now. You know, and, uh, I don't think anyone left. But anyway, we started picking up one person at a time, taking them into the ballrooms, and they didn't fight us really. I meant they might pull a little bit, but they didn't fight. And we take their name and uh, assign a, a court appearance and shoot them out the back door. We arrested 220, no, 225 actually that night, and the media all had 227, but they didn't realize that two of them we arrested earlier come back in and for a second helping, which ended up at 227. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a violent thing. Everybody left. You know, we, we cleaned out, and uh, that was the end of it, and it was daybreak, and... Uh, and uh, my officers are all, they've been up all night, so I sent them home. And uh, they had a rally in the mall that afternoon. Oh, the next afternoon? Yeah, that, 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 like we got out of there by 7. Okay. By noon or so, they're back on the mall, a bunch of them. And uh, they was a little upset about 220 some rest, and so they decided they'd go over to uh, Hubby. So a bunch of them, it's been 500 or more, went into Hubby Hall that afternoon. And uh, I was awake. I was on campus, and they called in the state police. Well, the state police, uh, they, they had must have had a platoon. There was 50 of them. And they formed up in the stadium parking lot in, like, a military operation. They all, and they marched down there <laughs> in order. Go over to Hubby Hall? Yeah, they come in around the back door. They go in the back door. And the kids just wailed them <laughs> unmercifully. They finally, was, the cop finally overpowered him, but it was, it was physical fights throughout. It was a lesson on how not to do something. So anyway, they, they left the Hubby then, and uh, then it was the, the turn. It was time for the disciplinary committees at the university to take action and uh, court action. Well, I thought it was kind of funny because uh, E. Kent Moore was a brand new lawyer in the area and uh, somehow the kids all went to him and he defended them all, you know, and he's okay. But I always thought he made his reputation right there on that. Anyway, that was... Uh, that was pretty much the end of the year, if I remember right. And then, uh, ooh, let's see. That's kind of winding down of the semester. Blue Angels come over. They come down, they had to put on a show out here, and I thought that was, that was kind of nice. Yeah. This one. We handled the, uh, the traffic control for that, and they, they wound up perimeter about a mile radius around the airport. No one, I don't know what, what, no one drive up and down or anything. I don't know what the 
what that was all about sure. or why it was necessary, but they wanted that. We did it. Uh, the next thing, uh, the amount of day thing, was following the Kent State. That was in 70. Uh, I think it was March. I think March. But they had a, a, a over in the Army, they had a big physical or a military review. Uh, a lot of the, uh, well, like all the Roxy students probably, but uh, they filled the Army pretty well. And a lot of uh, visiting uh, generals and whatnot were there. And uh, John Hicks, I know, was kind of in charge of the program. And it was going along fine. And all of a sudden, the, about 100 of these students were at the door coming in. <laughs> so John called and he said, uh, you need to get some officers to get over here and get them out there and disrupt them. can't do this military proceeding, whatever it was. And, uh, so we went over there, there's about 15 or 20 of us, I guess. And, uh, you know, we just thought we could get together and kind of, we had someone on standby. We knew something might happen. So we went in there, we went in there with uh, batons and uh, helmets and went in the uh, south door and announced, you know, everybody can leave. It's not supposed to be here, leave. You know, we opened the side doors and the north door so they could leave. And they just sat there about a hundred of them. So we had to actually push them out there, push them out of there. Well, there was only one really serious thing I thought where a guy got thumped on the head with a baton. And I, I know his name now, but uh, we took we took uh, another kid over to the uh, push. We took him on the ambulance over there. But he was okay, this treatment. But this other kid got hit on the head We never saw him again. He, he, then I found out through uh, the FBI that uh, he went up to Canada and then went to Red China from Canada. Never saw him again. Good riddance. He's a big kid, too. <laughs> out of the U.S. permanently, huh? Oh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> that was pretty much the end of the student riots. Right, then we, we moved on. On the fire department, now that they have more inspections that were not once the thing is up and running you inspect a lot of the buildings and of course with the research more labs and things yeah, we okay. actually have uh fire department doesn't do that much inspection okay. we had a separate division that does fire and safety inspections okay and uh they did that i hired a fire protection engineer and uh we had uh one two three fire and safety inspectors in those days uh -huh. Uh, they did all the campus inspections, and, and we did insurance. We did insurance evaluations and uh, managed the uh, loss recovery. In other words, they have a fire in sure. somewhere, and we'd send someone out, and they'd arrange for the workmen to come in and fix things and keep track of costs and so on. So that was the way the, the inspection process okay. worked. Okay. Couple things that you were involved in. You started the during your uh, tenure the campus safety task force. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, later on. Uh, we, was, we was getting uh, we worked pretty close with the students, uh, the student body presidents, and, and uh, a lot of the people from the fraternities and sororities. But they were, they wanted more input. They was they was unhappy with how dark the campus was. Was one of the main issues. Mm -hmm. and the communication situation. So we set up a, a student task force and we, uh, student by president would appoint people and West Lafayette would appoint someone there. Matter of fact, Judy Rhodes was on that committee. Oh, is that right? Yeah. She's good, too. Uh -huh. But, uh... Did you, were, were you involved in Oh, yes, yeah, so oh, I was okay. involved in it. And, okay. uh, the guy that worked for me that did most work with it was uh, Jim Roush. Okay. He did it. His son's now a chief over at Lafayette. Our, our police chief. But anyway, we worked with them for years and uh, we set up, uh, we'd make surveys on where we need additional street lights and I'd send them into the physical plant and they'd fund it and they'd put them up. They'd go good and the, and the emergency 
the phone phone to, yeah that's really nice yeah that was that. part of it we did yeah. that and uh, campus escort service we did that we started up the uh, student security patrol where we actually hired students to walk around at nights and uh, escort women to and from and watch for bad guys was the campus darker at one time than they put more lights in? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. When I first came here, it was dark. And they've been putting lights on regularly. Just yeah. Whatever you need is. You put, and, and they can do it at a reasonable cost. The way the university is built on their electricity, it's a, a ratchet thing, and then you meet your peak load in the middle of the afternoon. Yeah. So lights, and you, you might see the soccer field lit up all night. That didn't cost them a penny. At least yeah. it never used to. Well, they had the lights on the Mollenkopf Athletic Center, too. Yeah. For, you know. But after 4 or 5 in the afternoon, it doesn't mean anything. That's right, exactly. <laughs> so we did that. Uh, we set up uh, one of our most active things was uh, the uh, rock concert committee. That was mostly students. Uh, Bob Siebel was on it, and uh, or Don Siebel, I mean. Yeah. And he had some predecessors from the academic uh, areas that uh, preceded him, but he was on it for the longest. And they had all the big name bands come through. Uh, we had uh, kind of student security people in t shirts that worked all the concerts. Uh, we'd have maybe 25, 30 of them at a time at any one concert. And we, even before the concert started, and they got a kid, uh, we had one of those t-shirt things sure. for the rock groups. You know, right. that's what they're playing you for. remember uh, B-Squared Victory Varieties? Oh, yes. Oh, oh that was... We used to that. That was neat. Those was wonderful. Two, yeah. Every Friday and Saturday, two yeah. shows. Yeah. is when my family, my brother and... and their families would come. We'd either go one or the other, you know. And we saw Bob Hope, and I mean, really. we did too. Oh, it was yeah, wonderful. We, <laughs> went to a lot of them. Yeah, really good. Well, they're uh, a little bit different than the rock groups. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Exactly. A couple things: the um, parking and traffic committee, um, parking facilities. You set that up? No, to, no. Oh. That was set up before I got here. Okay. But not that, much before because it was doing the uh, design of the parking program that it now exists. Oh, okay. And that's the one that uh, OKB Woods and Jack Smalley and, and sure. John, John Gantz and Clayton Met and so on. And, uh, I went in there. And, uh, I started July 1, and I imagine before the end of the month, or probably before mid month, I was appointed secretary of that group because I went to all the meetings with them. And, uh, I was secretary for a couple of years, which I, I found was a very uh, good position to have because you could make sure things come up like you wanted to need to be done, it needed right. to be addressed, and you could describe your ear. You have a good ear for what's what needs to be yeah. and, or is being done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that was that was kind of fun. And now they have this the staff appeals as, as a division under that as well. You know? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, just a couple things. Campus life in the mid '60s when you first came. Uh, make any comments on that? Whereabouts did you live when you first came? Well, first we lived in the motel for about two weeks. Okay. Then we did down Mary Student Courts for about two weeks. Okay. Then we rented an apartment uh, on South Grant and Harrison. Then we stayed there about two years until we built this place. Oh, okay. That was it. Oh, sounds okay. Yeah, um, it was. Now, one of you were the Purdue. Now you're the police chief in '95 and '97. Well, yeah. Uh, the the police chief always reported to the director of safety and security. Sure. And, uh, was your office in Eden? Yeah, oh, okay. it was in those okay. days. And uh, well, I, for the last couple of years that I was there, well, early '90s. They moved me down to Freehaver, so I had an office in Freehaver because we still had any room in, in uh, Benin Ave. Anyway, the, the police chief reported to the director. And, uh, in addition, you still were head of safety and security, though, weren't you? Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then in the morning, what had he put on? <laughs> well, <laughs> Or yeah. keep two in the office and you can shift around, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> we, had, uh, we had 
two or three police chiefs there and while I was there, and, uh-huh. uh, and it worked out fine. But then at the end there, uh, last several years, uh, I had some real good help in the other areas. We also had uh, uh, radiological and environmental management for a period of time, and uh, the parking committee. We had some excellent people who was running those things, and I had the time and the knowledge. So I, I became the police chief too. Mm-hmm. Plus, I saved the position. We just watching, sure. the, watching the bucks in too. But uh, so I was both in the last few years, and I moved down to Terry. Yeah. Was that with the time when you then you got the new facility out yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you have to do much renovation? You know? Oh, that, yeah, a lot. Okay. Matter of fact, Janet, my daughter, did the basic uh, design plan for that. Well, they they come up with stuff, but uh, I mean, we got design people, works physical plan, architects, and whatnot. But they don't do police stations, and I wanted uh, to be able to. Uh, control the flow of information in a, in a very positive way. But Janet and uh, Julie, who was an architect in those days, she's a psychiatrist now, but anyway, <laughs> they decided, they, they laid it out, and uh, everybody said, that's a great idea, we'll do it that way, and that's what that's the way it come about. And uh, So we had a, we had a, an oar in the water, so to speak. It's fun. Yeah, it's that's fun. very nice. I think nice. they enjoyed it too. Yeah, that's. Do you find that that location is pretty good? Oh, a little it's bit excellent. better. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Uh, you can get in and out better yeah. than you can from uh, Enix, can't you? Oh yeah, and and they've changed the traffic flow around main campus so much that right, it's kind of hard to get around, and you, you hate to be driving on the grass. Or <laughs> right. Let me ask you this: What do you think about the uh, safety walks that they're putting in now? They didn't, oh, the crosswalks. Yeah, the cross. They didn't have those they have you know they always have white lines but people don't pay attention to them uh, yeah I'll be surprised they I'm sure they're going to get some compliance and that maybe that's enough of a reward right. but I can't envision <laughs> those students they, they, they jaywalk I jaywalk too and I try to look both ways and be very careful you know um, let me ask a little bit about outreach to the, to the campus and also the local uh, okay. community outreach yeah your liaison or your contacts and things? Well, I was uh, part of the Tiffany Emergency Ambulance Service uh, advisory group for years. Okay. And uh, we set, helped set up that the way it is. And a lot of political uh, input into that, too. Yeah, which, I imagine. Yeah, and, uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's the best of all things. But anyway, involved in that for years. Uh, I was in a lot of national organizations, uh, police chiefs and camp security and whatnot. Sure. But uh, and that was a source of information as much as right. anything. Uh, what else? I remember I was one of the founding members of uh, Wabash Township Fire Department. So good back in uh, seventy seventy one. Um, for athletic events, how do you coordinate? Uh, say football would be a good example or basketball you have people that help cross the streets but football is a lot bigger with this, the arena the stadium oh, yeah. yeah it is that's a that's a big activity for the police department uh, I would imagine yeah it is and uh, we get the help of the adjacent yeah, the state, department yeah state, state police uh-huh. they help a little bit not like they do at Notre Dame but they help us a little bit <laughs> What about the the sheriff's help too? Don't they? Sheriff does a good right, job. Right, because I yeah. see them at in the room in the perimeter of the yeah, stadium, inside yeah, stadium. Yeah. It's it's a community effort, really. Sure, right. Uh, and you need you need them because when they're leaving the stadium, otherwise the traffic would be chaotic. I mean, it backs up enough, but you know you need some semblance of order of some some way, shape, or form. You know, funny uh, bring up the the football thing. Uh, we used to we used to have a booth up on the roof of the press box, the old press box. <laughs> they have a room now, but anyway, it was up on the roof in the booth. And we you stu- and Johnny DeCamp, huh? Yeah, he was uh, he was down uh, down further, but down a couple of booths down. We was right on the north end, right by the elevator. Okay. Because we could go up, crawl up on the top of the elevator if we wanted to look at the parking lots with binoculars, and we did that. Mm-hmm. But we started putting uh, a, a video camera in the booth 
with a big lens on it, and uh, we find some inappropriate behavior. We can focus in on, it, document it, and go down and pick the kid up, and we got something to go to court with. Well, the students thought that was terrible. They had a thing in the exponent they thought it was terrible. So I invited the editor to come up to our booth with us. For the editor of the exponent? Of the exponent. Uh-huh. Yeah, and he came up there and uh, I explained to him what we're doing here is uh, we, we, the only thing we address is inappropriate behavior. And the way we identify that is when the people's neighbors, you can tell, you can see them, if they're unhappy with this drunk here, that's when we move in. And he watched the whole game. He came out. We arrested a few, I remember, but uh, come out in an editorial saying it was great. They were having their problem. As long as they know what the, yeah, the reasoning behind it, yeah. then they'll go along with it. They realize the value. Yeah. They don't want anybody else really to get hurt or anything like that. You know. They're still doing it. Yeah. They're still doing it. <laughs> Um, were you ever a faculty fellow at any of the residence halls? No. Oh, okay. No, no. Okay. Uh, tell us a little about your family. I know Janice here. When children, did they go to uh, come to Purdue? Or we, had our oldest son, Mike, mm-hmm. went to Purdue. He graduated in engineering technology. He's uh, worked for a subsidiary of Honda now, down in Fishers. Uh, got a family. Okay. We got grandkids. Our uh, second eldest son, Joe, he still lives in the area. He, he works for, uh, he's a uh, project manager, an estimator for a local construction company. Mm-hmm. Well, not local, it's out of Indy, construction mm-hmm. company. He's married, they got a couple kids. Uh, our daughter, our youngest one, didn't go to Purdue. She went to the University of Cincinnati and became an architect, then decided that was boring, and went into medicine. And now she's a practicing psychiatrist. Is she ever MD? Yeah. Oh, okay. Did yeah. she go to Cincinnati, the medical school at Cincinnati? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She's med and, uh, she's uh, working in a VA hospital right across the river in Kentucky. Uh, evidently, they have a lot of a lot of business you know, with veterans coming back. A lot of I problems. imagine, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And they got three kids, three boys. Uh-huh. Good. Um, you may, and I want to congratulate you on the Sagamore of the Wabash. Oh. <laughs> how did, I usually ask people, how did that come about? Uh, well. Did they surprise you? Yeah, they did. Good. Yeah, yeah. I like surprises. Yeah, it was, it was a surprise. Where did, where did the event take place? Well, they, they had a retirement thing for me. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, I don't know who's responsible totally, but I suspect Harold Adams has got a big foot in this door. You know Harold, he he was uh, a policeman in the fire department for years and years. He was the driver for uh, Steve Baring, and then for uh, Jitski. He was kind of the bodyguard and driver. Sure. And uh, it was funny though. And uh, did he used to deliver things? Maybe um, sometimes somebody, when Emily Mobley was the uh, dean, sometimes somebody would come over with a, a package or something like that. He might have been. Some delivery, I don't know, but they come from the. It was a gentleman. He'd come from the like the president's office. Could be, yeah. uh, probably who it was. Yeah, an older looking, nice looking gentleman. Older, yeah, yeah uh huh. And he's very active uh, in the legislature. He, he, I don't know. He spent a lot of time down there. So, when is Jit- he is he from here? Yeah. Oh, okay. He's up here, and uh, I know when Jetski became president, Baron said, "Well, his guy that drives for me and, and takes care of me." that. So Harold took him down to the legislature and introduced him to all the legislators who Harold knew and they knew him. Sure. So he did well. Anyway, I expect he had a lot to do with that That's uh, saying more of the Wabash thing. But they gave it to me in a, in a retirement ceremony. They had uh, and a lot of the local departments give me little plaques and that was nice. It was it's a nice, nice event. Right? Yeah, 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 it was. It was. Yeah. He had a nice article in the paper about you, too. That's kind of good. You know? oh. How about your hobbies? Any special interests? Any hobbies or special interests? Main main hobby is we travel. Okay. Now I'm going to ask for your retirement activities, what you've been doing. Do I have to do something? No, no, no. You have <laughs> I know. I, no, well, some people, they all have something to do. Yeah. But some people that I do know whom I've not, who have, I've interviewed, they don't volunteer. Oh, well. I'll tell you. They have different things. It's interesting. I think I learned a lesson. Uh, 
after I retired, well, we went on a trip or two. But anyway, uh, I was hired by uh, Hamilton County to do a, a security proposal for them on the security of the courthouse down there. They're afraid someone's going to drive a car in there and like they did over here, you know, with, with fire and all that. So I, I did that for them. And I'll tell you, I learned right then that I'm done working. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I guess I really hated to have schedules and deadlines and You did your bit for the workers. Yeah, I did. That was that was a learning experience down there. It wasn't hard. No. But uh I just didn't like having to be down there Friday at ten o'clock or whatever it was. Sure. So I've not done a whole lot of uh volunteer. I've been a little bit uh active on and off with the Wabash Fire Department. Mm hmm I was a interim chief here about Yes, I did three, read that in three three something ago, newspaper yeah. article. Yeah. They finally got that, is that Dutch Field, I gather? Oh, I yeah, yeah, I was only for like three months, I think, something oh, okay. like that. And it was just, it just, uh, it was getting close to the edge of <laughs> falling apart. And they wanted somebody to just kind of babysit sure. for a while. And I said, fine. Smooth it over a little bit. I hope. Yeah, right. Hope. Okay. It's, not, it's not done yet, though. <laughs> um, anything I forgot to ask or any closing things that you'd like to share with us? Something that I forgot to ask, or that you want to return to? Oh, you had some boy. notes on. Oh, so many things. Uh, you know, uh, routine okay. things that are probably documented in the, in the exponent and the papers. And you work pretty closely with the publications, the student publications too. Oh yeah. With this oh, staff. Yeah. Well, you got to. Right. Uh, you don't want right. to. You don't want to cause. It's a, a two-way street, and it's key. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta keep in mind, keep in mind that uh, the exponent journal career too, for that matter, buy their ink by their barrel, so you're probably not gonna outright them. Yeah, right. <laughs> they got the audience. There you go. Exactly. But I, I remember the uh, the blizzards. Well, you you were here then. You seventy eight. Yes. Seventy nine. We had back to back. That was terrible. <laughs> How about the ice storm in ninety one? Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. March. Yeah. We got a lot of firewood then. We have a wood stove down in the basement that... Uh, you were lucky. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> there was a silver lining in that cloud. Yeah, I think so. Uh, let's see. Well, we had a campus-wide service strike, service type stroke, struck for union recognition, but they didn't get it. Yeah, that, that was... Uh, Ronald Reagan came. Yeah. Ronald Reagan was here. That was, that was fun. Uh, it was expensive for the university, though, because I don't think they paid their bill. I may be wrong. What was this again? I don't think the Reagan campaign oh. paid their bill. They incurred a lot of expense when he came. When the president was here. Oh, yeah. yes. Well, this is when he's running, too. Oh, well, how about 87 when he came? Yeah, yeah he came in 87. That's that's after he was president. And, uh, they wanted the... Uh, Wait, tell us about the visit. How, how involved were Oh, uh, Secret Services. They're special. <laughs> uh Anyway, uh, they, they they do all kinds of things, and maybe they have to. You know, they, they're searching buildings and putting snipers on rooftops and this and that and everything. Our guys got involved in it, as did other local departments. Uh, we're all out in the motorcades and being at the airport. You know, I don't, I don't know what that. I bet that had to be a million dollar time. You know, if you total all the cost of everything, everybody contributed. To, just taking care of Mackey Arena where he talked. Yeah, oh yeah. And I had forgotten he did come when he was running, didn't he? Yeah, uh, yeah. a lot but of just for, not, But not on campus, but he was in the community, yeah, as I recall. Yeah. Bob Kennedy came. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and J did, Jimmy Carter. Right, that's right. He will, he and his wife were the nicest people. I mean, they were really, well, I'm not sure about presidency, but <laughs> sure. they were good people. Right, yeah. Do you get involved in uh, any of the people who come for the convos, like any of the lecturers do, who, who, and just police department or safety? No, involved? not really. Okay. Uh, we, we, we meet the rock group guys. Okay. Uh, and we, we like to convey our expectations, and they... they, they could the campus security, or the student security could also help out with that, I would imagine. A lot. Okay. A lot. Yeah. And that's kind of good, because it brings it down to a little different level, and they can mix oh, yeah. and things of that sort, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to sell them short. That's right. Yeah, right. And uh, uh, anything else you th that you can think of? Mm. 
Where's your next travel venture? We're, we're, we're going here. west next week. Oh, whereabouts? Uh, well, we got relatives in Iowa, Nebraska, and Colorado. Okay. And when we get to Loveland, Colorado, where Alaska relative lives, we're going to either go left to Grand Canyon and Vegas. If but if it's hot, we're going to go north to Yellowstone and Glacier National Park. Okay. Have you been to either of those before? We've been we've to the Grand Canyon briefly once in a wind in a snowstorm, south rim only. And we, last two years ago, down up. The Yellowstone? Yeah. 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 And that was really nice. Uh, any major trips to wait until after Labor Day because the, the crowds right. are smaller. Right, exactly. Get, oh. get on the road, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. We're looking forward to that. Yeah. Mr. Kepner, I want to thank you very much. What? Janet, I want to thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat>